Hello, I'm Mary Ann Morey, Central District Consultant with the State Library of Iowa. Welcome to this episode of Kernels, where our guest today is Jennifer Gogarty, Director of Slater Library in Story County, Iowa. Kernels is a small pop of continuing education from the State Library of Iowa. Kernels is an ongoing series of short videos from the State Library, and each installment is a small pop of professional development that gets right to the core of a library program, service, or library methodology applied in a public library setting. Kernels feature in-practice librarians uh, discussing their work so that other librarians can learn from their experiences. Today, we're going to talk about Slater Public Library's Meet and Eat program. It's a really wonderful program for seniors. And as I said earlier, our presenter is Jennifer Gogarty, who is the director at Slater Library. Jen, in a nutshell, tell us what is Meet and Eat. Yeah. So the Meet and Eat program is a free will lunch program that's open to the community where we serve a simple lunch and have some type of entertainment that goes along with it that we plan. Um, typically, the program is on the first Friday of the month, September through May, and we do take a break in January because that typically falls right like during Christmas break sometimes. So we don't do January. Okay. And I like your logo. Um, I know you don't have a graphic designer on your library staff. So how did you come up with, with such a creative and attractive logo? Yeah. So I looked online for some ideas of things um, that I might want to do. And then I used the Canva program to um, recreate something. Uh, you know, Canva is really great for templates that are already in there. This is done from scratch. I, I did have to find the elements I wanted to create because I wanted something completely unique um, just for, for us. So. Oh, it, it looks very nice, very attractive, very professional. This screenshot is, uh, from your website um, about a month ago, and it shows the calendar event notice about meet and eat. It shows the variety of programs you had October through December. So October was the central Iowa American guild of organists. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. November, you featured Sarah Utoff, who is an Iowa librarian. She was depicting Laura Ingalls Wilder. In December, you hosted local musicians performing seasonal music. So just in those three months, you had a program on STEAM, one on history, and one on music, which is quite a variety. How do you find your presenters or how do you determine topics for your programs? Yeah, so we do try to have a huge variety and we use a lot of sources for that too. So um, we pay close attention to what other libraries are doing. Uh, we also, in recommending, we also see if those would be a fit for us, if it's something that we can you know, take those ideas and make it work. Um, we also use local resources like our high school, our local history association, um, local residents, musicians, word of mouth. Um, and then we do use the Humanities Iowa as well. That's fantastic. I love that you're pulling from some of your local uh, population as well. And honestly, this program sounds like something that a large library would be doing, but you're definitely not a large library. You are a, a C, an Iowa C-sized library with a population of just a little over 1,500. Your library facility is definitely not large. Um, you have 3,600 square feet, which puts you in the 25th percentile of square footage for your size libraries. So definitely you don't have a lot of space. And you you have a, a meeting room of sorts, but it's really small, more like a boardroom, uh, more so than a meeting room. It's definitely not large enough to host gatherings. But I know that you just shove the furniture out of way out of the way and you do the programs right there in the library proper. You want to tell us more about your space and, and how difficult is it to rearrange things to hold these kinds of programs? Yeah, so we space is definitely an issue here at the library and has been for quite a while, um, so much so that we have to do our summer reading stuff at the park um, just because our we don't have enough room for all the kids that come, but we make use of what we have. So we are constantly moving furniture here at the library, whether that's for the meet and eat program, whether it's for our story time. Um, really, I'm not sure there's a program that we have that we aren't moving furniture for, um, but we just have to 
do what we can to meet our needs. So ev- for example, for the meet and eat program, everyone is set up differently depending on what the speaker needs. Um, sometimes we might need a screen, so we'll all have to face a certain direction. Sometimes we might face more of a central location. Um, one of the things that I do is I keep a diagram of where we set up for each time. So when I go back and look at, um, we have another program coming up, I can look at those and be like, oh, how did we set up for you know, the certain program that we had to make it fit for this. So um, those notes are very helpful. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have any quiet space during our programming. So we really have to make sure to let the public know ahead of time that, um, you know, we keep our calendars updated and we make sure to let everyone know what we have going on so that, you know, if, if they do need a space to study that's quiet, there are many times that we cannot provide that and we just have to be upfront about that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. This program actually started several years ago. And when you started it, you called it the soup and sound lunch. Tell us how and why you started this program. Yeah, so um, we started the program way back in 2014. So we've been doing this for a long time. Um, At the time, there were um, two community meals that were ending. Um, One was weekly and one was monthly. So we saw a need that was, um, we saw a need that needed to be filled. So we saw, you know, thought, was there a way that we can fill this gap? We don't have facilities for food prep. We only have a small dorm fridge and a sink, but we were trying to figure out if there was a way for it to work. Um, So we decided to do soup in crock pots, um, bring rolls and dessert from home. Um, The name actually came from you, Marianne. You had, we were talking about how we were wanting to come up with something and weren't sure what to call it. And you said, how about soup and sound? So um, that was uh, your suggestion. Um, we wanted to keep the cost minimal, so we did purchase a lot of reusable supplies, such as tablecloths, water pitchers, trays, tableware, decor, and that kind of thing. Okay, and at the beginning, and you must have caught me on a good day because I didn't remember that I had helped you with that, that theme. Um, but at the beginning, I think you only had musicians coming in. Was that true? That's kind of why you... Pretty much. I mean, that was at the very beginning, we thought that that would be an easy... Um, low cost way to have performers because we do local have a musicians. lot of local musicians. Right. Yes. And so um, with our piano, we could have pianists come in. We could have somebody that was accompanying another, like you see, we've got a fiddle um, in that picture there. So um, yeah, so that's kind of how it started. And then it just kind of grew from there as so we thought of different ideas and different programs that we could have. And um, it's, yeah, I mean, we've had to come up with a lot of different ideas and a lot of time now since almost 10 years. So years, that's incredible. (laughs) Well, back in 2019, I was asked to provide a year long blog for the programming librarian, which is an ALA website. That's all about programming. And I would say to our viewers, if you have not previously checked out the programming librarian, you will want to do so because there are always great ideas on it. Um, But in that year that I was focusing on small libraries in Iowa, I asked certain directors that I knew were doing great ideas and programs at their small libraries to take a month. And Jen, you took one of the months um, for this blog feature. You were featured in February of that year, and you talked all about the Soup and Sound program. So Mm -hmm. our viewers of this Kernels episode can click the link there in that slide that will take them to this article that's still available on Soup and Sound on um, about soup and sound from the programming librarian. But you noted in that article at the time that your budget for this type of program was under $50. Is that still true? Um, Maybe just tell us about some of the costs because that's usually the first thing librarians want to know when they're talking about programming. Sure. So yes and no. Um, I would say with the increased cost of groceries that I would have to say no as far as the amount that is spent for food. The last four months though, I went ahead and did a current average and our average for the last four months, including speaker fees was $81. So we're still not, um, you know, out of the range of um, feasibility, but- Less than $100 um, then. Yeah, so once you purchase the reusable initial supplies, um, the food and speaker fees are your only monthly costs. 
So <clears throat> we try to get most of our speakers in entertainment for free or at a minimal cost. Um, some are more expensive than others. I don't think I've ever paid more than $150 for a presenter for this program, though. Um, and we do keep food costs as minimal as possible. We just do a simple meal with the dessert. Um, we take advantage of garden produce when we can as well. Um, I have staff and friends that are gardeners, so we will use those ingredients when we get the chance. Um, that being said, though, this program has really never cost us anything because when we started the meal, we asked for a free will donation to cover the cost of the food. Um, we set the amount at $3 per person, and we have never raised that since, even with the rise in food costs. Um, we wanted to make this a program where anyone could eat regardless of if they paid or not. Um, <clears throat> and most people give the 3 to $5, and it's always enough to cover our costs. Um, we did create a sponsored program donation line in our budgeted income, and so we use that money for our program as well as like our summer reading programs. Good to know. Uh, when did you change the title of the program from Soup and Sound to Meet and Eat and why the change? Sure. So we had to take a break from this program in 20 and 21 um, due to the pandemic. Um, well, I should say we had to take a break from having it inside. This program was so important to us and our patrons that we continue to provide a meal once a month as a drive up pickup option for our patrons. So they would drive up in their cars. We would have a sack of food ready for them that they could get through their car window. Um, we could spend a few minutes chatting with them, checking in on them, seeing how they were doing. They would still, a lot of them bring their you know, $3 with them to hand to us. Um, so we did continue at that time. Um, but once we were able to come back and do it as a full program in the library again, which was in the fall of 22, we decided it was time for a fresh restart. So um, we changed the name to allow us to have more food options than just soup. And um, so we decided to create a new logo to go with the new name. Yeah, good idea. Um, I mentioned earlier that you've had quite a variety of programs. Here are some additional photos. You had one from someone that looks like, I believe that's U.S. Grant, mm -hmm. uh, a reenactor. One about a person who uh, took a pretty long journey in a canoe and another one about baseball. Tell me some more about some of the programs you've had that were especially popular with your community. Sure. Um, so we've been doing this a long time and we have had a large variety of item of programs. Um, I can kind of split them into a few categories. The first one being music. Um, most are free, but some others have a cost. We have had a pipe organ that we're going to talk about in a little bit. We've had a hammer dulcimer, a harp, a violin, fiddle, cello, handbells, vocalists, bagpipes, and even taiko drums, which that is by far the loudest program that we have ever had in the library. Um, we've had authors come. So like we've had Sparkle Abbey and Linda McCann. Um, Craig Bishop was a speaker about Billy Sunday. And then Hank Kohler, you've got there in the upper right hand corner who did the canoe trip. Um, we've also had school groups come. So we've had um, speech groups come when they're doing their speech competition. So you might have a um, acting ensemble group or a musical ensemble group that is preparing for the state speech contest. Um, we've had jazz and chamber choir here from the school. Um, so the one thing to think about when you are inviting kids, which it's great because you will end up with parents as well that don't normally come but that means that you have more food to prepare and more people and need to make more space for them. Cause of course, like if you're bringing a jazz choir of 12 kids, you've got 12 extra mouths to feed that are not going to be contributing to the cost. Um, we've had local speakers who talk about that they might have taken some really awesome trip and they want to come and, and talk about their travels. We've had somebody talk about a trip to Iceland, um, South America, Kyle Munson uh, has lived in Slater for a long time. He uh, used to write for the Des Moines Register and would go on the Ragbri trips every year and write about that. And so he came and talked to us about Ragbri. Um, we've had somebody talk about a historical house restoration and show us project pictures of their process through that. 
Uh, we had the Honey Queen from the state fair come in because that was a local person. Um, we've also had several historians come. Um, Dave Baker from the 29th state is an excellent speaker. Um, or we have had our local historical association come and do different presentations on like aprons or wedding dresses, different displays that they've had over there. Um, Humanities Iowa is a great resource. Um, Liz Garst, Pete Grady, who was the grant speaker. Um, you mentioned Sarah Utoff from Laura Ingalls Wilder. And then um, next Friday, our next one is Donald Schur, who is coming to talk about Lewis and Clark. So lots wow. of fun things. Yeah. Such a variety. I just love mm -hmm. that variety aspect. Um, and I think most of these programs are more you really just kind of sit and listen, more lecture presentation mm -hmm. style. Do you ever have any where it's, oh, we're going to make something today? Have you gotten into that at all? Or No. In fact, I think the organ program was the first thing where it was more of an interactive come up and do something. And it was a little like pulling teeth, like, no, come do this now. You right. need to get up. <laughs> so I think they were like, wait, I, I don't I don't want to do that. I just want to watch. So, well, that was a good yeah. segue into talking about this organ program. Um, I have long been interested in the first soup and sound and now the meat and eat program. And I, I often tout it to other librarians uh, particularly when I'm leading strategic planning events and libraries determine that they want to develop more adult program, especially for seniors. Um, but I've never had the opportunity to attend a program until this past October. I got to visit when you hosted the Central Iowa American Guild of Organists, more commonly known as Siago. And full disclaimer, I am a member of Siago because I am an organist. Um, I had helped Siago realized that libraries could be a wonderful, awesome venue for their educational outreach program, which is this tiny organ that you see in pieces on the table there. And this organ is known as Piper. And as you're assembling the organ, you're actually creating a miniature pipe organ. And with pipe organs, when you um, when you set them up originally, part of the process of getting them so they're playable is voicing them. And since the summer reading program theme a year ago was all about finding your voice, I said, this is the perfect year for Siago to bring this program to libraries. So Jen, you took advantage of that. And so I went to see what the presentation was like in action and to see your program in action. So in this photo, you see two Siago members, Dr. Miriam Zach from the um, Iowa State University, and Dr. Stephen Smith. So they brought that to your library and I showed up. And the first thing I noticed when I arrived at your library on this day was just how inviting everything was. The tables were lovely. There were real table covers with real dishes. Nothing was disposable other than the napkins. You even had table decorations. Um, the bowls were so pretty, all stacked up there waiting for soup to be served in them. And I asked you, how did you get these bowls? You want to tell us the story about that? Um, yes. So my mother is a thrifter. And when we decided to do this, we wanted to keep costs low. And in order to do that, we want something that we can reuse as often as possible. So I sent her on the task of collecting as many things as she could at thrift stores with just asking that everything be white. So she got white bowls, did, um, plates dessert plates, um, coffee mugs. Uh, she even went and found the silverware because we didn't care if it was matching. We just wanted real silverware. Um, told her how many place settings that we needed of everything. Asked for, you know, clear glasses. And um, yeah, so she was able to collect all of that for us and we keep it in the cupboard and we just wash it and use it. And it's an expense we've only had to pay for once and it was very inexpensive. How many place settings do you have? I think we have... 30. Enough for 30. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's always been sufficient? Yes. There's been a couple of times where we have had to bring things from home, like if we know we're going to be over. Um, but typically our attendance is between around 24, I'd say. Okay. Yeah. The next thing I noticed was that all of your staff was pitching in. Now, when I say all of your staff, it's not a big staff, um, but I saw them serving soup and setting up things. So tell me about how big your staff is and what is their role in the meet and eat program? Yeah. So during this program, there are three of us here. 
Um, and sometimes we will have a fourth person who is retired from the library who helps start this program. And she likes to come back and sometimes she will provide food because she is an excellent cook and that's just something that she loves to do. So sometimes there are four of us. Um, we split up the duties for meal prep. Um, we all work together to set up, serve the food and coffee, bust the tables, do the dishes, um, and clean up. Uh, we also have to take home laundry home sometimes because there are towels and washcloths and tablecloths to wash too. So we all just take turns. Um, it is a tiring day, um, but it's very fulfilling. We're told repeatedly how thankful everyone is for the program and told time and time again how nice it is to have someone to eat with. So many of these people are widows um, and live alone. So they just love the social aspect of it and um, having a meal with someone, regardless of what we're doing. So it's it's been good. But yeah, it, it is a lot of work, but we all just pitch in with whatever's needed. And we don't have time in this Colonel's episode to go into any of the research about the importance of socialization, particularly for seniors. But you brought up a, an excellent point, Jen, that you are meeting a need and it's an, an important need for the uh, health and well-being of the older population within your town. Uh, so that's that's wonderful that you do that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of brings up again, another thing that I noticed when I was there was just how happy everybody was and how they talked and chatted and laughed and seemed genuine, genuinely happy to be there. Um, the day that I was there, you had vegetable soup, rolls and spice cake dessert. It was all delicious. And I think you said earlier, that's kind of a typical meal. Mm -hmm. um, very simple, just cooked in crock pots, sitting on the counter. And we can see in the photo there, your uh, donation box. Um, it, it was it was just a very enjoyable occasion. Um, this was another thing I noticed was that you and your staff sat and talked with the the attendees and you participated in the program. Is that something you're always able to do? Um, yeah, usually, but not always. It kind of depends. Um, so we plan for the meal to start at 1130 and then we don't start the entertainment until noon. So that generally gives everyone a chance to have eaten their meal um, and we can usually get the tables bust and most of the dishes picked up before the speaker starts. And so if we are able to do that, then we will sit down and eat while the speaker is going so we can um, participate that way. I thought that was good. It's a good way for you to interact with your patrons and the people who are in, in the program. And at this particular event, it was a good way for you to set the example, hey, come up and help with this, because you're right, this program put on by the Central Iowa American Guild of Organists uh, was very interactive, very hands-on because you, the audience, are actually assembling the pipe organ. There's a photo of you putting the keys on the manual there and uh, another picture of you and your assistant, Julie, putting in the pipes for the organ. Um, so it was a cool program. And there's another one of your employees who's holding the music for Dr. Zach as she performs on the assembled organ. It was just a great program. And I'm Pretty sure your attendees enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, this is a more recent photo uh, from your December program. I see a few of the same faces who were at the October gathering. Do you have a group of regulars or do you have folks that attend based solely on the topic? Tell us just a little bit about your audience. It's a little bit of both. Yes, we definitely do have regulars, people who have been here since the beginning, um, who look forward to this every month. Um, then you always, you know, will gain a few regulars through time and you will lose a few regulars through time as well. Um, but uh, I would say, depending on the program, you can have other people come as well. Uh, when we had Sarah Utoff come with the Laura Ingalls Wilder program, we had a homeschool family with kids that were able to come that day as well. Um, when we had Liz Garst, who I don't know if any of you know who that is, but um, she from the Garst family that um, is now a Syngenta plant that is here in Slater. Um, it's an agricultural group. So when she came to speak, a lot of people from Syngenta wanted to come over and listen to her talk. So they came over on their lunch break. So it really does vary, which can make it hard to plan because you never quite know how many you're going to have. But most of our regular people let us know if they're going to be there or not. And um, so we're able to kind of get an, a gauge on how much food we need to prepare. 
Well, obviously, this is a successful program. You're entering your 10th year now. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned something earlier about your piano. Your December mm -hmm. program featured some local musicians, and I did want to point out the electronic keyboard that you have. Did you have this? Did the library own this prior to the start of the what was then called the Soup and Sound program, or did you buy this specifically for the program? And um, tell us, too, I see some microphones set up there. Is that something the library owns? Yes. Um, so those actually are the musicians' microphones there. They did bring their own, but we do have some as well. Um, so back to the piano, we got the piano shortly before we started this program. Um, I'm a big proponent of the arts and I want to be able to include music in our programming as much as possible. And I thought this would be a good way to do that. And so then once we had it, it was more of, okay, now what, how do we incorporate music into some of our programming? That's part of where the, um, this program came from. Um, so we were able, we don't have a lot of space. So there was some, and we are also moving our furniture often. So we had to think about what type of a piano would work for us. So we went and decided on a digital piano um, for a couple of reasons. It's lightweight. It's easy to move. Um, you don't have to, it doesn't take up a lot of space. You don't have to tune it. Um, and it still is a full size keyboard with pedals. So um, that we decided on a Yamaha Clavinova and we bought it on Craigslist for about a thousand dollars with money from our friends group. Um, and then we all, as far as the microphones go, we do have an AV system that our friends also purchased. Um, so we have um, speakers in our ceiling so that we can connect into that with our microphone system. We also have some portable ones that we use for things like puppet shows. And um, if we go to the park for story time, we will take um, a, a speaker and microphone there too. So we do have quite a few AV supplies mm -hmm. um, that we use very often. It sounds like you relied a lot on your friends for some of these larger mm -hmm. purchases. Um, so that's something for librarians who are watching this to consider that perhaps grant monies or a local friends group or local mm -hmm. donations could help with some of these initial costs like the a keyboard or the dishes that we mentioned earlier. Uh, another thing that I noticed when I was there was just how willingly all of your staff pitched in uh, before all of the guests had left. You and your assistant director were in the staff room. This is not a kitchen. You don't have a kitchen at your library. This is barely a break room. Uh, you have a sink and a microwave. And I think you said a college size fridge in this room. And there you are at the counter, hand washing the dishes with smiles on your faces. And I, my first thought was, oh, this is what's meant by other duties as assigned in the job description. Um, just again, how did you get staff so on board with this? They seem so willing to pitch in. I know you said that it's fulfilling, but how did you approach them with this idea in the beginning? Yeah, so I have an awesome staff, I will just say. And um, usually when we come up with things, it is a collaborative effort when we do that. So when we sat down, this was not just me saying, I have this great idea, we're going to go do it. It was, you know, we all sat down and we're like, what can we do? Like, I'm kind of thinking maybe we need to have some type of lunch. I'm not sure how this will work. And another staff person is like, hey, I think if we did this and this and this, we could make it work. And so it really is, was a collaborative idea that we have continued to do. Um, thankfully, we're all on the same page. We all chip in. Um, and I always try to get input from my staff when considering new programs and procedures. That's great. I want to talk very briefly about your mission statement. This is quite an undertaking, this program. Uh, how do you feel it meets your library's mission statement, which I have here on the slide? In our mission statement, we try to provide service where we're at and not just give over our services to bigger libraries that surround us. So um, in order to serve the people here and provide things for the people in our town, um, we just really want to do that right here where they live. Um, I've lived in a small town or worked in a small town my entire life in Iowa, um, five different communities, and it's always important to provide those services for the residents where they live. Um, 
We want to remain relevant and we want to thrive and we want to grow right here in our own small town. Um, I don't like to give into excuses why we can't do something, but instead I try to find a way to adapt an idea that will work and I want to do it well. Mm -hmm. And your mission statement, the first part of it right there is to serve the community and um, you're definitely doing that with this program, I think. And the uh, paragraph, the bottom paragraph we see on the slide talks about building relationships within the community. And again, this uh, meet and eat program definitely helps build those relationships. Um, just very quickly, as we get ready to end here, meet and eat is not the only large program your library does. You've mm -hmm. taken a, uh, developed a very successful teen and tween book club, hugely popular in your community. And at the close of the reading challenge each year, you sponsor, you the library, you sponsor a field trip. I will just mention that libraries can learn or librarians can learn more about this program by accessing the archived webinar the State Library presented last year about book clubs, and it is available in Iowa Learns and on our YouTube channel. But uh, Jen was one of the presenters in that who talked about developing successful, unique book clubs for teens and tweens. You also have a successful book club for adults that meets monthly and does, quote, additional activities, as well as an annual fall day trip. So you are so right that you are doing just so many things that we might think larger libraries would be doing it, but you're doing these things at your small library, just, just doing a fantastic job, Jen, you and your whole staff. I'm really pleased with what all you do. Um, is there anything else you want to add? I imagine most of our viewers were going, oh my goodness, this woman She's like super woman, super librarian. How does she maintain this energy? How does she do this? All these programs, these big programs. How do you maintain the energy and the enthusiasm, Jen? What's your secret? I'm not sure, <laughs> to be honest, but I will say that I have a passion for my job and a passion for the people that we serve. Um, I have a great staff who works well together. I try to utilize their strengths and passions in the programs that we plan um, I will say time management is key, and I do love the variety that my job allows. Um, you have to have a balance of those programming days, and you have to have those days to catch up in the office as well. So you can't go, go, go all the time. You have to have those busy days and the quiet days. Okay, so if somebody wants to start a similar meet and eat program at their library, what would be the first step? What would you recommend? Yeah. So the first step I would say um, would be to, you know, look at your funding and see if you have what you can to get those um, things that you can reuse, such as the dishes and things like that. We have used paper in the past. Um, it's just it's a it's a cost that you're going to have to have constantly, um, but it's not as nice and people notice like we've tried to get away with not having it and people are like, oh, we, we have paper today. <laughs> but um, so I would say definitely your costs. Um, think about those in the things that you will have that you will not have to replenish often. Um, and then, you know, just don't overthink it. A simple meal. Um, you know, something, it doesn't have to be soup. It can be pulled pork. It can be taco salad. Um, but something that's easy that you can make ahead of time that you can bring with you that day. Um, and then, you know, you do need to advertise well and let people know what you have going on. And, um, typically word of mouth when food programs are involved is not a hard thing for people because they want to invite their friends and everybody wants to to get out and have food, especially for this um, senior population. A, a hot home cooked meal is important to them, too, because they might not be getting that at home. I think you've definitely shown us that a small library can do big things and that you can do sustainable things. I like the sustainability aspects of your program. Um, all of our kernel episodes are posted to the State Library of Iowa's Continuing Education YouTube channel. We have a whole playlist of them, so check them all out. These are also cross-posted to our Iowa Learns Learning Management System. Iowa librarians can watch them there for CE credit. Um, Jen, thank you so much. I am sure you have motivated and inspired many of our librarians to go and do big things in their libraries. And I'm sure if anybody has specific questions, you would be willing to 
have them reach out to you at Slater Public Library. So thank you so much for what for sharing your your um, your ideas here, and thank you for what you're doing in your community. Absolutely, thanks for having me.